Amen, amen. Thank you guys so much. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. If you have your Bible this morning, I pray that you do. Amen. This is a good place to bring your Bible to. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and if you don't have your Bible or you don't have your mobile device there, we have some Bibles there for you that you can make use of. Well, since the end of August, we've been uh, walking our way through some specific instances when faith was either tested, when faith was either grown, or even in some cases, we looked at some uh, situations where faith was celebrated by our Lord. And then last week, as I said in my welcoming remarks, uh, we were blessed. We were blessed to have some special missionary guests with us from all around the world. And what a week we had. To God be the glory. Again, I give all the praise to Him. But man, I'm thankful for those of you, listen, who stepped up and stepped out by faith last week. Amen? And uh, our missions uh, uh, efforts will continue on to God be the glory. And I'll be honest, I was a little bit shocked and a little bit in awe of how the Lord worked again. But uh, as I said in the Sunday school hour, that's what God's been doing for over 40 years here on the hill. Amen? And so we give Him the praise and the honor and the glory. But now that missions revival is over, you may be saying, well, what next? And you may have started to think, man, well, it's October, the leaves are starting to change. Pastor, you know, it'd be a pretty good idea if you started preaching some messages on gratitude or being thankful. I mean, we are coming up on Thanksgiving. Don't worry, I'll get there. <laughs> have patience. <laughs> have patience. I'm just waiting for the first day of November to start because that's when we're allowed to do the 30 days of thankfulness. Although I would suggest we need to start that puppy on January the 1st and have 365 days of thankfulness, amen? But anyway, we'll get there soon enough, but today I felt like it would be a fitting conclusion to my previous message series if uh, we were to look at one more final story, one more final story uh, that points us really to the reality of one man's faith, and that for this man... For this one story, for this man, Jesus was worthy of his all. Jesus was worthy of his all, and whether we've ever stopped to think it, whether we've ever stopped to consider it ourselves, the same is true for each and every person that has a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's really worthy of it all, isn't he? A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus, and I said he was Lord of all. And you remember I have my little plastic crown here, and uh, it was amazing after service. And some of you know the story, so I'm going to tell it so everybody hears it. Uh, after the service, I took the golden crown. You remember I said that we typically listen to the one who wears the crown in our life. Isn't that true? Yeah, or your wife if she's wearing the crown. That's right, Ernie. <laughs> but as I exited... There was one of our young ladies, and she was standing there, and uh, I said, well, here you go, honey. I said, why don't you see what the crown looks like? And so I put on, and I said, man, that crown looks so amazing on you. It looks better on you than it does me. And she says, absolutely, because girls rule. <laughs> I said, true, <laughs> true. You got me. You got me again. But I said that Jesus was Lord of all, but today I want to talk to you about the fact that Jesus is worthy of our all. Last week during our missions revival, we were reminded that every believer, every blood-bought child of God, everyone that believes in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and life everlasting, every one of us are missionaries. Oh my, oh my. We're all called to missions, right? In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote it, writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4. He urges the believers, and, and by association, he urges us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1 that we're to walk worthy. In other words, we're to live worthy of the vocation. Now hold on to that word here for a second. We're to live or walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. And notice what he says in verse number 2. He says we're to do it. In all lowliness, in other words, with humility. We're to do it in meekness. We're to do it in gentleness. We're to do it with long suffering or patience. And then he says, forbearing one another in love. Now, I want you to go back to verse number one because I said, hold on to the word vocation. Because Paul says that we're to walk worthy of this vocation. The word vocation, 
literally means invitation. We have responded to the divine invitation of Jesus Christ. As believers, once we respond to that divine invitation of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we are new creations in Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. But if you follow on to that, verse number 18 tells us that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And you say, well, how do I do that? Well, verse number 19 says that we've been given the word of reconciliation. And you know what? Here's the capstone of it all. Verse number 20 says that we are ambassadors for Christ. Listen, every Christian has a ministry. Whether we like it or we don't, we've been given a ministry and we have all been given... The Word. You say, well, hold on. How do you know I've been given the Word? Well, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so if you're a blood-bought child of God, you have heard the Word of God. Therefore, you have the Word of reconciliation residing in your heart. You have a ministry of reconciliation. And uh, so we're actually to be reconcilers. You know, I see a lot of people who want to start arguments all the time. What if we went out and we just loved people and tried to draw people to Jesus? What would that look like? What would that do for our church? What would that do for our neighborhood? Oh, listen, we all have a ministry. We all have a word. And and the reality is, did you know this? That Jesus Christ, God through Jesus Christ, has conferred upon every believer an ambassadorship. Joanne's an ambassador to the country of Tanzania, where she has been an ambassador for 24 years, sharing the love and the truth of Jesus with people. You see, missions is actually God's plan, but in God's plan, which is kind of crazy sometimes, because when I look in the mirror, in fact, yesterday, it was amazing at uh, Shirley's service, there was a gentleman sitting back over here uh, where you guys are, Josiah, kind of about where Josiah is sitting, and I walked by, and I had seen this gentleman years and years ago, before I left Northern Virginia and went to Missouri to Bible college and was serving out in Missouri for a while, and I remember him. But something had changed. The fact that my hair was white and falling out had changed. The fact that his hair was a little bit better than mine, salt and pepper, had changed. And I remember this guy. He used to be like this rugged, rugged, tough and tumble guy. And uh, that had not changed. He still looked about the same. And I said, I said, man, I said, uh, that's crazy that you're here. Man, I didn't know how you knew Shirley. And so we started talking back and forth and one another. And he said, are you, are you the pastor here? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, God has a sense of humor. He, he lets us actually serve him. Can you imagine it? We're not worthy to do anything, and yet he allows us to serve him. I said, I said yeah, it's hilarious, isn't it? He said, man, I can't believe you're back here. I said, yes, this is my lot in life. I'm back here. Pray for me, brother. No. Oh, listen, folks, you ought to get excited because we represent the king. And listen, as we've talked about uh, two weeks ago, he is Lord of all. And so if he's high and lifted up in our hearts and in our minds, man, we can do all things according to his power that works in and through us. Listen, if he's our Lord, as Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 says, I just think that whatever we do, whatever we do, we ought to do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. You know, we got a lot of men pleasers running around today. We got a lot of women pleasers running around today. But can I tell you, you'll never go wrong if you just please the Lord. That doesn't mean you're going to be popular. That doesn't mean you're going to have uh, all the riches of this world. But I can tell you that you will never, ever go wrong if you do right with the Lord. It was author uh, Keith Wright who said this, and I've used this before, but I like it so much we're going to use it again. He said, lost people matter to God, and so they must matter to us. Which is why I believe in having a strong missions ministry here at Battlefield Baptist Church. You know, throughout the gospel accounts, Jesus prepared, he instructed his disciples. And what was he preparing them to do? Say it out. Yeah, that's right. Somebody said it. Amen. You got the right answer. He was preparing and instructing his disciples to go 
In fact, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, he tells him to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, before he tells them to go, the really cool thing is he actually assures them of his own power. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And he says, hey, therefore, guess what? Since I've got the power and since you belong to me, he says, go. He says, go and preach. He says, go and teach. Go and baptize. Go and disciple the whole world. This is what Jesus was talking about. And I think about just before his ascension into heaven, I was talking about this on Wednesday night. His last words just before ascending into heaven. He says, hey guys, I got some, I got some news for you. I'm getting ready to go up to heaven. Remember I told you that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He said, do you remember that time when I was talking to you over here? He said, now here's what I want you to do. He says, you need to go out and you need to be witnesses in all of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Now, if you look back at Acts chapter 6, I want to remind you of some things as we draw close to Acts chapter 6. As we read Acts chapter 2, 3, and 4, you can clearly see because Acts chapter 1, he says, listen, you're going to be witnesses. And they go and they start praying. And then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls. And we can see some great things taking place in the early church right out of the gate. But can I tell you, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, and Acts chapter 4, and even 5, they're primarily taking place in Jerusalem. So up until we get to the point of Acts chapter 6, there's a whole lot going on in the city of Jerusalem, and not all of it's good, but there's a lot of things going on in Jerusalem. But you remember, what did Jesus say? He said, go ye into all the world. He didn't say hang out at home, battlefield. He didn't say hang out in the pew. Now, I'm glad you're here. By the way, you need to call your buddy, call a friend, phone a friend, and tell him to get back in the Lord's house. Amen? These pews are comfortable. They'll find rest for their weary back on these pews. Get them back in the Lord's house. And, and so by the time you get to chapter 6, here's where we're introduced to a man. By the way, there's a need in the church in Acts chapter 6. And, and, but anyway, we're, we're introduced to this man named Stephen. And Stephen's story is a huge turning point, not only in the book of Acts, but in the proclamation or the spread of the gospel. Notice at the beginning this need in the church. And Scripture tells us here in... Uh, in Acts chapter 6, you can look uh, um, in verse uh, number uh, 4, it, or 3 rather, it says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And it was the business of taking care of the widows. And so you can see that Stephen is among one of the honest men that they actually choose to assist, serve, and care for widows. Look at verse number 5. It tells us, verse 5 tells us, Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now, for those who have become too familiar with the story, and by the way, I would encourage you, sometimes we get real familiar with Scripture, and so when we pull out a passage or when the pastor says John 3, 16, you're like, oh, I mean, really? Do I have to listen to John 3, 16 again? Oh, I mean, yes, 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 I know it, Pastor. God so loved the world. And so I would encourage you to be careful of doing that with Scripture. And if you're not careful in Acts chapter 6, when you hear about Stephen, you say, I mean, this is all we know of Stephen. I mean, it's a pretty insignificant role, don't you think? Very small. I mean, I mean, a small and insignificant in the grand scheme of things. I mean, if you read on the rest of the, the book of Acts, it's primarily dealing with the Apostle Paul and the ministry that Paul has after his conversion. I mean, and so a lot of people will say, well, I mean, what was Stephen all about? Can I tell you that this word that we're about to look at gives us a richer picture of what was taking place with Stephen's faith? Look at verse number 8. Because verse 5 said he was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 8 says that Stephen was full of faith and power. Where does he get the power? The Holy Spirit. He's full of faith and power and that he did great wonders and miracles among the people. How do you think he did great wonders and miracles? Who's doing it through him? The Holy Spirit of who? The Holy Spirit of God. This is God working in and through Stephen's life, and this is exactly what he wants to do in our lives. 
I can tell you when we live or walk worthy of our faith as ministers and ambassadors for the Lord, right? We've been given the word of truth. We've been given the word of reconciliation. I can tell you that the Lord will use you. You say, man, is that braggadocious or is that boasting? No. The word of God accomplishes exactly what it desires to accomplish. We just have to be faithful to go out and to share it. By the way, when you share the word of truth, when you share the word of reconciliation, when you go out and you're really an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you're going to get the attention of people. Have you ever tried to witness to a friend? You got their attention real quick. It was okay. It's like the missionary said, it's okay, uh, Don Barry was talking about sharing our story, remember? And it, it's okay to talk about um, the, the, uh, the football game later today. It's okay to talk about the hockey game or the baseball game or whatever game or whatever movie you just saw or whatever's coming down the pipe at work. But the moment you turn the conversation to Jesus, sometimes it gets real quiet, doesn't it? Have you ever had that? You're like talking about a lot of things, and all of a sudden you say, you say the word Jesus, man. The brakes hit. Folks, can I tell you, sometimes the response will be positive, but sometimes the response will not, not be so positive. It might even be a negative response. And this is the case in Stephen's, in Stephen's life. In fact, look with me at verse number 9. Now, I'm going to read here. I want to read a few verses from verse number 9, Acts chapter 6. Now, I'm going to read from the CSB uh, what it says here. After Stephen's doing great wonders and miracles and God's using him in the CSB, here's how it puts it. Opposition arose. <laughs> Have you ever had opposition arise against you? Anybody? Nobody ever had any opposition in this life. It's just been peachy keen for you. Thank you, uh, my brother in the back. I won't call your name, but thank you. You've had a little opposition. I dare say everyone in this room's had opposition at some point. You might have had opposition. It had nothing to do with Jesus. But here's what it says happened. It says opposition arose to what was taking place with Stephen because of his bold faith, because God was using him to do wonders and miracles. It says opposition arose. Look at verse number 9. However, from some members... Uh, However, from some members of the Freedmen's Synagogue, composed of both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, they began to argue with Stephen. And verse number 10 says this. Verse number 10 says, But they were unable to stand up against the wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. Verse number 11, Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and of God. Now just stop here in verse number 11 because it says, and then they secretly persuaded. The Greek word there means that they actually hired. They went out and they procured people to lie against Stephen. Do you think that happens today? I don't know. Call me crazy. These people hated. Watch. The response was so negative. They're like, uh-uh, we've already dealt with Peter and John. We're, we're, not, we're not allowing this to take place. They hire people. They go out and procure people to come and lie about this man. I got news for you. That ain't nothing new. That ain't nothing new. If you find yourself in ministry at all, you will find all kind of people lying about you. I probably have three or four heads. I don't know. My wife thinks I have at least two. <laughs> Guys, this is what's taking place in Scripture. Look at verse number 11 again. They secretly persuaded some men to say, we heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. Look at verse 12. They stirred up the people. So here's what they do. They stir up the people. They stir up the elders. They stir up the scribes. So they not only get the bystanders, they get the church people riled up. So they go and hire people to get the, the church people riled up about what Stephen is saying, and they came and seized him. That word means that they came on him without warning and in hostility. They seized this man, and they take him in violence to the Sanhedrin. Verse number 13 says that they uh, also presented false witnesses. More. 
they get more people. This is crazy, guys. Look at what Scripture's saying. They find more false witnesses who say this. This is what they say. This man never stops. He never stopped speaking against the holy place and the law. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. They're talking about the temple. And he says, and he will change the customs that Moses handed down. And then in verse number 15, the Bible says, And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently on him. And notice what only God can do. They look at him. They hear all this stuff. But when they look on Stephen, they see his face as if he had the face of an angel. In the midst of all this opposition, in the midst of all this fake news, so to speak, they were saying about him, this false witness, these lies that people had conjured up, they had been paid to say these things. The Sanhedrin, they look on Stephen and they say, oh my goodness, he has the face of an angel. And if you know scripture, you know in Acts chapter 7, the high priest begins in Acts chapter 7, and he says, uh, he said, are these things so? So he basically asked Stephen, is all of this stuff true? All of these false witnesses, all this stuff that they're saying about you, is this true? And then for the rest of the chapter, most of the chapter, Stephen proceeds by preaching one of the longest sermons in the book of Acts. He goes all through it. He literally gives a detailed history of Israel all the way back. And he brings it all the way up through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He points them to Jesus. And then look down at verse number 54 because here's where you see what takes place. This is, this is what takes place in verse 54. It says, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. <laughs> they were cut to the heart. They were enraged. And the Bible says they gnashed on him with their teeth. That's an ugly picture there, that they gnashed on him with their teeth. It, the imagery, watch this, the imagery is as if a pack, like a pack of hungry wolves. These are the so-called religious right. The religious leaders of the day became like a pack of hungry wolves as this man tells the story. Look at verse number 55. Verse 55 says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Can we just stop for a second? Sometimes, can I just encourage you today, if you don't get anything else, you say, man, I've already turned you off, whatever. Sometimes we just need to look up. You dealing with something today? Are you fearful today? Look up. You filled with some kind of uh, sinful problem today? Look up. Because I can assure you, if we'll stop looking down on our issues, if we'll stop looking around on who's right, who's wrong, who's in the middle, who's to the left, who's to the right, and we'll start looking up, guess what? Just like Stephen, we'll see the glory of God. Amen? That's a message in itself. I could preach that for about 30 minutes. Just look up. He says, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God in verse number 56 and said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, don't get your feathers all up in a twist about Jesus standing because I'll go there in a minute. But he sees him standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran on him with one accord. And verse 58 says, and they cast him out of this city and they stoned him. Do you know that that was illegal what they were doing? They were supposed to have a vote. They had no vote. They had no talk about it. They literally ruined, run him out of the city and they stoned him, the Bible says, here in verse number 56, uh, or 57, 8 rather, excuse me, he says they stoned him and watch this. Here's what I wanted you to catch. And the witnesses. Hold on a second. Have you ever paid attention to that before? Look at verse 58. It says, and the witnesses laid down their clothes. Folks, that, that's the false witnesses. Those are the ones who are procured. Those are the ones that were hired to lie against this man. Are you kidding me? These false witnesses lay down their clothes at the young man's feet. And we know him. As Paul, but before he was Paul, he went by the name Saul. Saul consenting unto his death. And look at verse 59. And they, 
They stoned Stephen. Folks, the truth did not matter. It was a murderous mob scene. But notice verse number 59, because in the midst of it all, look, it says, and they stoned Stephen, who was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8 first before we move on. Verse 1 of chapter 8 tells us that there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Can I tell you that the, the great persecution was not because the disciples were going into all the world and preaching the gospel. The persecution was acerbated and began to thrive with great great fierceness because of the boldness of one man's faith. One man named Stephen. The persecution started at all. By the way, Stephen, one person, can you think about it? One person who was convinced that Jesus was worthy of his all, and this is what began to take place. I put in my notes that as believers, you and I have been blessed as beneficiaries of the good news that Jesus saves. And so we must ask ourselves the same question that Stephen had to ask himself in the moment in which he was being persecuted. And that question is whether Jesus is really worth our all. Is Jesus really worth our all? Think about it. Is he really worth our all? I'll ask again. Is Jesus really worth our all? I didn't know if we had to pray about it or not. Can I tell you God is good? He's good all the time. Jess, Anna... Rhonda, kids, yeah. I lost my mom when I was 10 years old. Can I tell you, God's good all the time. He's good all the time. It ain't good right now. It doesn't feel good. But he's going to wrap his arms around you. He's going to keep on giving you a big old bear hug of love. And he's going to tell you that you are my child. And he's going to love you. And the rest of these people around here, they're going to put their arms around you and love you boys as well. And the rest of y'all as well. He is so good. You see, if we hope to reach our world, if we hope to reach our world with the love and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must understand that we're going to have to exercise some good old-fashioned faith. Spain was saying in his lesson this morning, he even referenced it, he said, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We have to go out believing just as Stephen here. I'm going to give you a few things just as Stephen did. We're going to have to believe that God actually wants to use us. We're going to have to believe that God wants to use us. And I shared this with you a few years ago, but it was Stephen Neal in his book, The History of Christian Missions. Here's what he said. He said, the only thing that's more remarkable than the speed at which the gospel was spread during the first century is its anonymity. He said, by the end of the first century, there were three major church planting centers in the known world at that time. He says, there was one in Antioch, one in Alexandria, and one in Rome. He goes on to say, he said, what's amazing is that we have no idea who actually planted any of these ministries. Now, if we go to Acts chapter 11, we can, re we can read how the church was planted at Antioch and we, re and we actually re read how some men actually who after the persecution that starts to take place in Acts chapter 8, it works its way out. They were actually scattering all around the known world at that time. We can read how these men went and they preached Jesus in verse number 20 of Acts 11. But in verse number 21, God's word says that a great number believed and turn to the Lord. 
There again, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that took place in Antioch. When it comes to Rome, we know that the Apostle Paul, over and over, he wanted to go to Rome. Rome. I must needs go to Rome over and over. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 28, when Paul actually finally gets to go to Rome, the gospel has already been, been proclaimed. In fact, in Acts 28 and verse 15, the Bible says that when the brethren hear that Paul's in the area, they actually come out to meet him at these three taverns area uh, outside the city. They come to meet him. And the Bible says in verse 18 that when they came out, Paul saw them. This is what he, he thanked God. He thanked God and took courage because the gospel had already gotten to Rome. Folks, the point is the, whether it be the first century or this century, the gospel spread just then as it does now through ordinary people just like you and just like me and just like Stephen who had determined that Jesus was worthy of his all. Oh, yes. I believe the Lord wants to use you and I to do the same in northern Virginia, but we must believe that God wants to use us. And secondly, here's the key. you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? you got to have the Spirit. Acts chapter 6, look back at it. Verse 8 tells us Stephen was full of faith and power, but the key is not that he's full of faith and power because if you don't know the rest of the story, you say, well, where does he get the power? You have to go back to verse number 5, which then tells us he was a man full of faith and well, there it is, the Holy Ghost. In other words, no Holy Spirit, no power, no Jesus, no Holy Spirit. They're all connected, and before his betrayal and arrest and crucifixion, Jesus, you know, he's teaching his disciples in, in John chapter 13, John chapter 14, and 15, and 16. And John chapter 16, you know, Jesus says, hey, guess what? Uh, he says, because the world hated me at the end of John chapter 15, he tells them, hey, they're going to hate you as well. He gets to the beginning of John chapter 16. He says, guess what? There's coming a day when the world will persecute you. They will kill you and think that they are doing the world a favor. It's basically the translation of what Jesus is telling them. But when you get down to verse number 7 of John chapter 16, here's what Jesus says. He says these words. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless, I tell you a truth. By the way, Jesus doesn't lie. Amen? He doesn't lie like your co-worker. He doesn't lie like a family member. He doesn't lie like a so-called friend. He doesn't lie like your boss or whatever the case may be. He doesn't lie. And so he says here, he says, I'm going to tell you the truth. He says, it's actually beneficial or expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, praise the Lord. He says, if I depart, guess who's sending the Holy Spirit, by the way? Jesus says, I'm going to do it because I'm in charge. I will send him unto you. Oh, my friends. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I told you that Jesus told him to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. But what I didn't share with you, and I didn't do it on purpose the first time we talked about Acts 1-8, is the fact that the beginning, the Bible says, Jesus said, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. As a Bible believer, as a believer of Jesus Christ, you and I have a power that resides inside of us. And whether you have ever taken the opportunity to exercise that power is up to you. You're going to exercise the power? Are you going to try to do things in your own right? You see, it was the knowledge that God's power was residing in him that enabled Stephen to be willing, to be ready, and the ability to stand in his faith when trouble came his way. You remember last year we had missionary to Haiti, Kevin Faldi, who was here. Man, what a message. He was, going, he, was, he was like a fireball last year. And you remember he said these words. He said, real faith is not for characters in a play. I thought that was good, and I remembered it. Real faith is not for characters in a play. You see, it's something that you and I must rely on and exercise every day. And as believers, Jesus says we all have the same power residing in us. And since that's the case, every one of us can actually exercise real faith just as Stephen did. Again, here's the key. 
No Jesus, no Holy Spirit, no Holy Spirit, no power. In Acts chapter 2, I referenced that a lot of things were going on in the early church. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 4 tells us that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You remember in Acts chapter 4, after Peter and John, they're arrested and thrown into jail for teaching and preaching Jesus. The Bible says that after they were let go, they come back to the church, and the church gathers. And you know what the first thing they do? They have a prayer meeting. They actually get together and they pray. And if you look at the end of chapter 4, verse number 31, tells us that after they prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and then... They spake the word of God with boldness, just like Stephen did. Oh, my friends, you and I are not to be filled with wine wherein is excess. Ephesians 5.18 tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Romans 8.6 says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Oh, my friends, when the Holy Spirit of God is leading and guiding our lives, you and I can be sure that we will be positioned and we will be enabled to do only what God can do. We'll accomplish great things. Not because we're great, but because He's great. Oh, so listen, we must believe that God wants to use us. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. But look at verse number 59 of chapter 7. I just want to say this. Our lives have to reflect Jesus. If your life is not reflecting Jesus to someone, that's a problem. If you say you have Jesus in your heart and in your life and your life is not reflecting Jesus to someone, there's there's a problem with that, sir. There's a problem with that, ma'am, young person. Look at verse 59. It says, And they stoned Stephen calling, and he's calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneels down, and he cries with a loud voice. Notice what he does. He reflects Jesus in this most intimate, in this most horrific moment of his life. He's being stoned to death. And notice what happens in verse number 60. He says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It's literally a mirror of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the mindset? Let me ask you a question. If we took you out of the church today and started stoning you in the parking lot, would your mindset be, Lord, lay this sin not to their charge? I don't know any one of us that would say, Lord, forgive them. Lay not this to their charge. That was the Holy Spirit's power that was working in and through his life to say such a thing. It's incredible to me to think about in his dying moment, Stephen is actually trying to do for others what Jesus had done for him. Pointing people to Jesus. He was reflecting Jesus. It was Martin Luther, that great reformer of yesteryear, who said it would not have mattered if Jesus had been born or died a thousand times if no one ever heard about it. Think about that. It wouldn't have mattered if he was born or died a thousand times if no one ever heard about it because the preaching of the gospel is essential to a person believing the gospel. And that's exactly what Stephen did. I think about, you remember, it says that these false witnesses who are stoning Stephen, what did it say? They took off their coat and they laid him at the feet of who? Saul. And if you know, Saul has a conversion experience. He's on the road to Damascus. And the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And and on and on, his life is totally radically changed. And it was Paul, whose life had been radically changed, who turns around when he writes to the church at Rome, and he says these words in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's life was so transformed. And we look to a number of his letters in his life that he led after being saved as as a barometer of, of how we really should follow Christ as well. And he says in his letter to the church at Corinth, he declares this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish 
foolishness. But unto us, he says, unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Have you experienced the power of God in your heart and life? I pray you have. I pray you have. I think about Paul writing to the church at Philippi. In fact, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, just a couple of pages over. I want you to see something. Philippians chapter 2. It's actually on page 760. Some of y'all get that in a minute. <laughs> page 760. <laughs> the precious word of God. Uh. Philippians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. In verse number 5. An amazing passage of scripture, one of my favorites. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, notice what he does. He humbles himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Oh, may we live humbly and obediently in a way that reflects Jesus to the rest of the world. Do you know that you can go into Walmart and reflect Jesus? I would encourage you, the way to reflect Jesus is not to complain about the meat prices. The way to reflect Jesus is not to be disobedient to your parents in the toy lane. Pastor, you don't know how tempting it is when I get over by the toy section. Oh, I know. I know. I, I have boys. My youngest, he made a habit of going to the toy section every time we went to Walmart. I said, look with your eyes, not your hands. Can I tell you, you it's hard to reflect Jesus when you're talking about other people. It's hard to reflect Jesus when we won't even pray for our loved ones. It's hard to reflect Jesus if we're not going out of our way to show them the love of Jesus. Oh, my friends, it was C.T. Studd who famously, he was a British missionary, a British missionary of years gone by. He's the one who famously said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You see, I, I researched that a little bit further. Because, leave that up, yeah. So we see this quote and we're like, oh yeah, I heard that years ago. But I did a little research to find out what caused C.T. Studd to make this statement. It was because his life motto, he had a life motto and here it is. His life motto was that no sacrifice was too big or too great to make for Jesus who had died for him. It's like if I buy you lunch today, how many people would be excited about that? I see one lady went right up, boom. I'm excited, Pastor. Buy me lunch. See my wife. She allows me to have no money. Aiden, I know you'd be excited. Praise the Lord. But how excited would you be if a tractor trailer was coming your way or an errant tire was coming your way, wheel, <laughs> And I jumped in front of that wheel to save your life. This is what Jesus did. He died on the cross for me and for you. Oh, what joy should fill our hearts. What gratitude we should have. As C.T. Studd said, he said nothing, no sacrifice. Listen, to this. this is his motto. No sacrifice was too big. Or too great to make for Jesus who died for me. This is what he was saying and he was right. Which is why Paul actually encouraged the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. He said this, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now hold that up there guys because the word conversation means conduct. The way of life, the way that we're living. He says, let your conduct, let the way that you live be in such a way as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, people need to see Jesus. <laughs> let me ask you, this is just a poll question. Do we believe that Jesus is the answer 
for sin? Do we believe that he's really the remedy for sin? I mean, it's a simple thought. People need to see Jesus living inside of us. But here's the deal. It's not enough for them just to see Jesus living inside of us. We have to tell them about Jesus. We have to love them enough to tell them about Jesus. It was Charles Spurgeon who once declared this. He said, either, every Christian is either a missionary. It's hard to even say the last part. He said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Oh, we must believe that God wants to use us. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Our lives have to reflect Jesus. And then I close. Just as Stephen was convinced, we too must be convinced that Jesus is worthy of our all. Look back at Acts chapter 7 and verse 56. 55 rather. 55. Let's look at 55. Acts chapter 7. And the Bible says, But he, speaking of Stephen again, being full of the Holy Ghost, he's got the power. Amen? He's got the power. He looks up. He looks up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And you say, Hold on, Stephen sees Jesus standing and not sitting. Well, join the crowd. Down through the ages, this is where I get crazy because you get a lot of smart thinkers, a lot of people who want to go out to whatever. <laughs> they want to go out and hang out and they want to debate. This is impossible. This says, this means that God's word is null and void because Jesus sits at the right hand of God. There's no way he could be standing up. Let me just tell you something, sir, ma'am, young person. You don't tell Jesus what he can do. And neither do I. I get crazy sometimes. People are like, oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. I got him, I got him. Christianity is a, it's a, it's a blip on the screen. Now, it's, it's all going to fall apart. No, it ain't going to fall apart because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Even though the gates of hell are trying. Believe me, look around, they're trying. If you don't think they're trying, they're trying. But I get crazy. People say, well, Jesus can't stand. He's supposed to sit. Jesus can do whatever he daggone pleases because he is king of kings and lord of lords. But this doesn't cause a problem for me. If you're a great theological thinker and you're like, oh, pastor, you're just so low-minded. You just keep everything so low. You're not a high theological thinker. That's okay. Because when I see Stephen looking up, when I see Stephen seeing the glory of God, and when I hear about Stephen seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, that gets me excited you know, I think Jesus was standing because he's actually proud of Stephen. I think Jesus is standing because he's ready to welcome Stephen on home. He says, soon and very soon you're going to see the king. So come on, Stephen, come on home. I'm ready to wrap my loving arms around you. You're doing big things, Stephen. And I think Jesus is standing because he's actually, you know, he's actually got some pom-poms in his hands. He's like, yeah, tell him about me. I don't know if he did it like that. I feel like that's how Spain would have done it. He's got some pom-poms out and he says, Stephen, he said, the world may be calling you a fanatic. They may be calling you a fool, but I call you faithful. So get them on, Stephen. Just tell them about me. Just tell them about Jesus. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we are living in perilous times. We're living in perilous times. In 1 Timothy, in first, don't, don't change the station. I'm going to read it. You stay right there. In 1 Timothy, uh, I said 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Listen to this. In verse number 1 and following, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Folks, we're there. We're there. For men, are you ready? Are you ready? Because it ain't pleasant. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. We're there. Covetous. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, hello, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Aren't we there today? 
I mean, we got church houses all over the United States of America. We're supposed to be the beacon of his light going into all the world, and yet there's church houses half empty today because we're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's what it boils down to. Verse number 5, the Bible says, Having a form of godliness, but, not, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Truly we are in a world right now that is calling good evil, and they're calling evil good. And you know what? For the most part, what we're doing, we're sitting over on the sidelines like, uh, 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 uh. Instead of standing up and saying, you know what? Jesus is worth it all to me. So I'm going to tell people that Jesus loves them. So I'm going to tell them about my story, about how I was dead in my trespasses and sin, and how Jesus loved me. And because of his rich mercy, he loved me and restored me and quickened me and brought me, reanimated me and my soul and spirit back to life. Romans 13, 11 tells us that it's high time It's high time to awake out of our sleep. It's high time to wake out of our sleep, folks. Because now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Peter writes these words at the beginning of 1 Peter 2 and 7. And he says this, he says, Unto you, therefore, he's talking to believers. He's talking, remember, he's talking to dispersed Jewish believers all around the world who are running in fear and persecution. He says, Unto you, therefore, which believe he. He's talking about Jesus. He says he is precious. He's making a distinct difference between how believers and unbelievers see Jesus. And if I go through Scripture over and over, I'm reminded that Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of our all. The psalmist said in Psalm 18 that the Lord is worthy to be praised. In Colossians 1.10, we're told that we should walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. In Revelation 4, in verse number 11, the Bible reminds us that Jesus is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And then in Revelation chapter 5, in verse number 12, you can read that whole chapter, but in verse number 12, the Bible says that only Jesus as the Lamb of God is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. But the question remains, how precious is Jesus to us? Is he really precious? Because I got some news for you. This ain't our home. You don't like the color of the carpet? That's okay with me because this ain't your home. You don't like the paint color? That's okay with me. I'm not sure I like it. Well, you're the pastor. It don't matter. This ain't my home. You know what I am? You know what I am? I'm just passing through. Watch. This is me and my life. I'm passing through. I'm like a pilgrim and a stranger. And one of these days... That's what's going to take place. You won't see me anymore. But I got news for you. You know where I'll be? I'll be with Jesus. We're just pilgrims and strangers passing through. And for the life of me, I don't understand what we're doing. I know I'm not the sharpest tool on the shelf or the brightest light in the box, whatever you want to say. But I do know know this. People need Jesus. Do we believe they need Jesus? then we have to ask ourselves the question, like Stephen asked himself. Is he really worth it all? Because to Stephen, Jesus was worthy of his all. You may be here this morning, and you say, Pastor, I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm going to be transparent with you today. And you, I don't want your hands up or I don't want you to jump up. You may say, you know what, I've never, I, I, don't even, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. I've heard about him. I know that, you know, my parents maybe told me that he's God. And I've heard that he loved me. And I've heard that he died on a cross for my sins. And I, I heard that even though I'm an ungodly person, which... You know, no one had to remind me about I, I know all these things that 
he did this because he loved me and he cared for me. And I've heard this, but I've never actually called out on his name and asked him to forgive me and to come into my life. Maybe that's your situation this morning. Can I tell you that in the quietness of this moment, nothing would make him happier than to hear from you this morning that you would call out and say, Lord, please forgive me. Come into my heart and change me. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Pastor? I hear what you're saying about Stephen. Are you telling us that we have to die for Jesus? No, I'm just asking you to live for Jesus. I'm asking you to live for Jesus, but do you know that there are people even today that are probably, statistically wise, they are dying as we are meeting here for Jesus. There are persecuted believers all around the world that are dying for their faith. In this country, we are blessed enough still, we are blessed enough still to live for Jesus. So that's all I'm encouraging. Just to get into your heart and to our minds that God wants to use us. But without the Holy Spirit power generating that, that willingness and that ability and that desire to share that truth and love with others will not do it. And understanding that if we have Jesus in our life, we need to put him into practice. We have to reflect him to others, understanding that he's worthy of it all anyway.